This is Introduction to Quantum Computing, week number two, where we're talking about the qubit. This is the third topic. We've already spoken about what a qubit is, what a state is, how we represent that with linear algebra and using Dirac notation, and now we're going to talk about how we can change the state of a qubit. So pictorially, we've seen that already. but it's worth spelling it out in detail. So we've seen a picture like this before, and what that picture means is that this state, psi prime, is equal to this object here, u acting on psi. And these objects Looking back at your usual linear algebra, it's just standard matrix multiplication. So I have my two-dimensional complex vectors, those are my states, and then how I change them into new vectors is with this matrix U. Recall that in order to satisfy the constraints of this model, which were I have these two-dimensional complex vectors, they're unit vectors, and they have to remain unit vectors. So in order to do that, this thing here must be a unitary matrix. And that's a matrix that satisfies this equation here. So I take the complex conjugate transpose and I multiply it by the original matrix and I end up with the very special matrix called the identity matrix. And the identity matrix is one with ones and then diagonal and zeros everywhere else. Uh, very easy to specify in two dimensions. Okay, so in this pictorial notation, I start on the left and. Is my. Oh, there's a mirroring. I start on the left and move to the right and that specifies in time how the state of the qubit changes by applying the unitary matrices that appear on this line which we call a wire. So the notation here is the circuit Again, very similar to classical circuits. And then this thing here is the wire, and it is the thing that specifies the physical qubit. So the wire represents the physical qubit. The uh, boxes represent how the state changes, and at any point in time I can label the wire with whatever state the qubit happens to be in. So some very special uh, particular unitaries that, oh, let me just say this one more thing, since we're talking about notation and then may have said it already, so I might as well define it. Uh, these unitaries in the context of, of computation are, are called gates. So special gates. We have already the identity gate, right? That's the one with ones in the diagonal and zeros in the off diagonal. We have what's called the X gate. And another one that we'll look at is the Z gate. 
in linear algebra, we can specify matrices either you know, completely or in terms of what they do to a particular basis. And again, as I mentioned, we'll try to work always in the computational basis. So we can specify each of these as how they change each element of the computational basis. Okay, so the identity is the unitary or matrix that doesn't do anything, so the 0 and the 1 states remain the same. The x is one that swaps 0 for 1, and when we, we think about these binary labels of these vectors, you can see that what it's done is a not operation. So this is actually a logical not. And we'll start to see throughout the subject that kind of buried within quantum computation is classical computation if I'm only ever going to do logical operations on the labels of these computational basis elements. Where do things start to change? Well, they start to change here, where in this Z gate, the zero state has remained the same, but the one state now has a minus one coefficient in front of it. So if I look at the circuit or the operation where I start in this plus state that we saw last time, so I'll rewrite that out. So I have Z and it's going to act on this plus state, which is zero plus one with this one over root two coefficient in front of each basis element. And because matrices are linear, I can apply the Z to each of the elements of the basis. or any linear combination for that matter. And then I apply this rule uh, that I see here. So uh, this is the other nice thing about Dirac notation. Uh, I've, I've just applied linearity. And if I know what how Z acts on each of the basis elements, then I can, uh, without ever writing down matrices, solve this particular computation. So I can look up back here and say that you see that the Z that hasn't changed the zero state, but has it put a, a minus um, on the one state. So in fact, what Z has done to zero, uh, sorry, to the plus state is taken it to the minus state. Uh, and what you can see here is that it, it, it's, it, it's changed this, uh, this coefficient uh, originally, that both of them had the same coefficient, and now they have opposite coefficients. Okay, so this this is uh, a special case of a phenomenon called interference, because you can imagine that uh, once I do a more compu complicated computation, then uh, these minuses are going to start to cancel with some of the pluses, and terms are going to disappear. So this interference phenomena is sometimes uh, suggested as where quantum computation gets its power from. Now if I'm thinking about starting my computation in all of these quantum circuits in the computational basis, one of the computational basis states, then none of these gates that I've written down actually generate these superpositions for me to start trying to interfere them with. So how do I generate superpositions? And that's with uh, a very special operation that we're going to see over and over again called the Hadamard gate. 
and its matrix representation looks like this. But what it does, oh, we use the same notation as before, it takes the zero to the plus state and the one to the minus state. And what typically happens in almost all of the quantum circuits that you see, at least the introductory ones, is we, by convention, we start every computation in which all of the qubits are in the zero state. And then we start to add gates to our quantum circuit. And what you'll find is that almost all quantum algorithms start with the first step of applying this Hadamard gate to every qubit. And that's to generate these superpositions. And so that's another kind of area or suggestion for where quantum computation gets its power is in these superpositions because uh, almost all of the quantum algorithms that, that demonstrate some speed up have this first step in which you generate a superposition with the Hadamard gate. Okay, so we have these quantum circuits. They start in some state. Presumably we know what that is. We apply these, these gates to it and then it ends up in a new state. Okay, so uh, what next? How do we read that quantum information? And that'll be our next step.